Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. I've done, I think, about 525 of them now or something. Um, if this happens to be new to you, you haven't seen any of these before, and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. My guest today is Sebastian Blacksley. Uh, welcome, Sebastian. Thank you. Sebastian is down in Buenos Aires, Argentina. <clears throat> um, he is a native of Buenos Aires. And he was born into a large traditional Catholic family. He attended a Jesuit school, of which the headmaster was Jorge Bergoglio, the current Pope Francis. And um, I guess you're kind of friends with him, aren't you? How, you know him pretty well? Yeah. Well, he was part of, you know, the institution. And also he had a very close relationship with my father, who was working with him and with the Jesuit organization for more than 40 years. So I, I, I know him um, quite well. He was the director, you know, um, kind of the authority for a high school student. So um, I want to love him. Yeah, he's a wonderful man. We just watched uh, a movie the other night on Netflix called The Two Popes. With, yeah. with uh, I forget the actor who played him. Anthony Hopkins played the, the previous pope, and it was, it was yeah. really good. Um, okay, so... Um, Okay, although Sebastian wanted to be a monk as a young man, his family did not consider it acceptable, and the inner voice that he always obeyed let him know that you must be in the world without being of the world. He studied business administration in Buenos Aires and completed his postgraduate studies in the United States and Argentina. He also attended other studies in England, followed by several highly responsible positions in well-known international corporations, living and working in the US, England, China, and Panama. He then founded his own corporate consulting firm in Argentina and led it for over 10 years. <clears throat> At the age of six, Sebastian was involved in a near fatal accident during which he heard a voice which later identified itself as Jesus. As I understand it, that um, accident involved you getting thrown under a train or some such thing? Yeah. Actually, it was a, a car accident in which my mother was driving and I was inside the car with my brothers and sisters at that time and the train crashed to the car. Hit the car. And one of my, yeah, and one of my brothers called Peter died in that accident. Oh, I'm sorry. It must have been traumatic. And you were just six at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you heard the voice of Jesus, and um, and ever since then you've been in communication with Jesus. It says, well, let's just read this. Yeah, ever since you've continued to hear that voice, um, you say, since I can remember, I have felt the call of Jesus and Mary to live abandoned to their will, so that despite my various activities, I always put spiritual and religious reality at the center. I'm very devoted to my Catholic faith. faith. Um, so what did the voice of Jesus say when this accident happened? He said to me, don't be afraid. I'm here with you. And that was the only thing that he was repeating and repeating over and over um, during that moment. And he kept saying that for the next hour or two hours when we were at the hospital. So um, when he said, don't be afraid, I'm here with you, I felt completely embraced by him and no fear was possible at that time. So that was 
exactly what he said to me. Mm. And you were a little boy, of course, um, and you 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 were being raised in the Catholic tradition. Um, so how did you? Do you think that possible? I mean, how did you know it was Jesus? Do you think maybe it was just because you were steeped in Catholicism that you assumed it was Jesus, or was there a sort of a certainty that this is Jesus? There was a knowledge. I knew at that time who was that person, and that person knew perfectly well who I am. The encounter with him was for me an encounter with someone whom you know from ever and ever, and you just um, reconnect with that person. The best that I can say is to compare this with a little boy with a, the voice of a mother. He knows it's his mother. that that voice comes from his mother. Um, so I just know that. That's good. Yeah, that's a good example. Um, so in, two thir- in 2013, you began to record messages from your mystical experiences. In 2016, you miraculously discovered a course of love and felt the call to devote yourself to bring it to the entire Spanish-speaking world. Now, um, a friend of ours who helped to organize this said that there's a kind of a miraculous story about your discovering a course in love. First of all, now, a course in love is Marie Perron, right, whom I've interviewed. Mm-hmm. She Did she channel that or cognize that? Yeah, Marie Perron, who you interviewed here, yes, yes. Uh, was the first receiver of uh, A Course of Love, yeah. Okay, but how or why was it miraculous that you discovered it? I mean, it's, it, it was out there publicly, right? So, Well, not in that case, in, in this case, because um, that was in um, during the Easter time um, in 2016, um, I went to the chapel to have my morning prayers, and um, it's an it's a chapel called for adoration, which means that there is nothing except of yourself and the silence and God um, with your experience. So there is there shouldn't be anything except of yourself. But when I went into the chapel. Uh, which is a very little chapel close to my house in Buenos Aires, I saw a book uh, which was very strange for me uh, to see that in in that chapel. And the book said um, A Course of Love. And when I opened the book, um, I immediately recognized the connection with Christ, with the voice of Jesus Christ in that book. And um, I tried to find the book, but the book was not here. So um, I went to different stores and tried to get the book, but the the book didn't exist in Spanish. Um, So I started searching and I contacted uh, Taker Publications, um, which is the, the publisher, and uh, Marie Perron to see where I could find that because I felt the need to share this for the Spanish-speaking world. And they said it didn't exist at that time. So we worked in the process of, uh, with other person called Coralie Pearson, Um, she conducted the translation process and we brought into the Spanish-speaking world the uh, Spanish edition of A Course of Love, and actually we founded um, a foundation called Un Curso de Amor for you know, publishing, editing, and distributing uh, A Course of Love. So uh, it didn't exist at that time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it might be worth it at this point um, explaining what A Course of Love is, and perhaps if, if so, if any, if there's some relationship between that and a course in miracles, and then how how a course of love would relate to 
traditional Christian teaching. Would it, would, it, would that be interesting for people to hear? Oh, I think definitely, yes. Okay, good. There are a lot of conversations about that. Um, you asked me about why this was miraculous. Um, and one of the reasons is because um, that experience that I have with that book was exactly the same experience that I had in the same chapel six years ago, before that time, in the same day, in Easter time, with another book in same situation. And that book was called A Course in Miracle. So and someone left the book in there and you just yeah, found it there. Somehow, yeah. Um, when I found A Course in Miracle um, many years before, I was really touched by um, A Course in Miracle. And I was, uh, you know, walking through my spiritual path through a Course in Miracle for almost six years until I found A Course of Love. And I, I believe there is a completely integration uh, with both revelations. I believe A Course in Miracle came to help us to heal our mind. And A Course of Love came to help us to move from our mind to our heart and to integrate both dimension of what we are. So um, I think both are part of one thing. It's part of the oneness. So um, that's why I, uh, that is one of the reasons why I enjoyed a lot watching your conference about the paradoxes and the contradictions. Um, because You're referring to I, a talk that I gave at the SAN conference that I just put up on BatGap the other day. So, so just for context, I'm explaining that that's what you're referring to. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's very valuable because uh, it's all about integration into the oneness. So the voice of love, can talk to us from different perspectives and from different realities. And the Holy Spirit has the capability of talking to us in the way we need to listen to that voice. Um, because there was one time when Jesus Christ said to me that because he is the voice of love, he can talk to us in any language, in any context, and including our humanity. So integration, I think, is very important because it talks about union. And I think A Course in Miracle and A Course of Love are a unity. Yeah, it's like A Course of Love was the sequel or something to A Course in Miracles. Yeah, and um, you know, there, um, I talk with many people uh, about this, um, and I think if we are open to receive what love wants to give us, then we can get in through different perspective and angles and point of view. So some people go from a course of love and then to a course in miracle, um, and some others go from a course in miracle and then to a course of love. Um, love is not a sequence. So uh, we can get in through different perspectives. Um, and I love both. They are very important in my spiritual path. Yeah. There's a saying in India that when the mangoes are ripe, the branches bend down so that people can pick them easily, you know? And, yeah, and, um, and it sort of relates, I think, to the idea that, um, you know, the, the divine or whatever we want to call it will provide access or will provide teachings that are appropriate to each person, you know, based upon their orientation, which 
which means that there are going to be all sorts of different approaches and different teachings and so on that different people will relate to more easily. Um, that's one of the things I said in that talk. I think I used the phrase, God is not a one-trick pony, which is a phrase from a Paul Simon <laughs> song. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, the creator of the vast multifarious universe is certainly capable of providing a variety of, of approaches so as to cater to the ca individual characteristics of each, uh, you know, spiritual uh, aspirant. Yeah, definitely. And you, in your question, you ask about how I integrate that into my traditional Catholic mm -hmm. beliefs or uh, spirituality. And something that I learned from my experience and from the revelations that I receive is to receive with my heart. So when you read with your heart, instead of reading with your, your you know, intellectual mind, you can um, receive the books as a true letter of love. And when you receive, let's say, the Bible or a course of in miracles or a course of love or the books from St. Teresa of Avila, just to say one of the important books for me, um, and you read it with your heart, you know who is talking, and you enjoy the relationship with that voice. And your relationship with that voice transforms you into the oneness with that voice. So it's like a kind of music for your heart. When you when you read with your heart, and um, I think a course in mir in in love, a, a course of love, helps us to read with our heart. Um, so I, I love that. Yeah. I think it's um, you know just God writing a letter for me. Yeah, I I know what you mean. It's sort of like you can read something and you can intellectualize and like crazy thinking about it and everything, but you can also just kind of settle more into the heart and kind of feel the waves of influence that, that wash over you as you read each, each passage. Absolutely. And, and I think you, you use the most important word for me, which is feel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Virgin Mary said to me once that, the heart is the center of the spirituality. So um, we really need to go to our heart instead of using our, you know, intellectual mind. And in that area, we are all one. Yeah. Now, I wouldn't say that we have to toss out the intellect, um, but it has to be more of a integrated thing. We have these various faculties, you know, we have the intellect, we have the heart, we have the senses, and all these things are part of our makeup. Um, but usually people end up being lopsided, you know, with one or the other predominating to the exclusion of the others. Thank you for saying that, because that is exactly as you said. Um, we have a mind, and we have to honor that, and we have to respect it. And we also have a heart, so we can think and we can feel, and we need to put both in the same level. And um, that's where I believe a course of love and a course in miracle helps you to do that. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about who Jesus is and, and Mother Mary and, and all that. Um, everyone has heard of them, of course. Now, you know, you have a quote in your book that I copied, which is that compared to the infinite vastness of the self that spirit is, the material universe is like a small mustard seed at the center of perfect spirit. But the material universe, by ordinary standards, is huge. Um, you know, if you, one third of the stars in the night sky that we can see are within 250 light years of, uh, of us. And if you take a, a picture of a galaxy and put a put a little circle where 250 light years is, it's only a tiny little dot. And so it's 100,000 100, light years for, the, for light to cross the galaxy. And then there are 
trillions of galaxies. And so there are undoubtedly, you know, countless trillions of, of inhabited planets, um, all of which, or many of which have, well, if they're inhabited by fairly highly evolved beings, then there are, there's a spiritual yearning in those beings, in my opinion, um, because what spirituality is all about is completely universal and timeless. Um, so I don't know. Sometimes, you know, I'm not, I know you wouldn't be this way, but sometimes you hear more fundamentalist Christians saying things like, Jesus is the only way, and if you don't go through Jesus, then you're doomed. And you know, and then they they try to argue, to support that argument by saying that the universe is only six thousand years old, and <laughs> all kinds of crazy ideas. Um, so it, I, it might seem like a kind of an intellectual inquiry, but I'm sincerely curious whether um, you would consider Jesus to be sort of uh, universal in the sense that God Himself is universal. Uh, in other words. Um, having jurisdiction over the entire universe, or whether Jesus is more of you know um, an authority, as it were, for our planet, and there would be other beings like Jesus on other planets throughout the universe. Thank you for asking this question because this question talks about who God is at the end of the day, and when I started to receive. Um, what I received since 2013, the first thing that I listened was, I came here to answer the question of who am I? Um, and that voice explained me how important it is to answer that question. Because the way we answer the question of who God is or what God is, is in the way as we are going to have the relationship with us, with the universe, and with our brothers and sisters. So um, I think your question is the fundamental question. And um, moving that question into the figure of Jesus uh, and Mother Mary, um, for me, they are the incarnation of Christ. So the Christ consciousness um, have, um, let's say, a new step of incarnation in them. And after that moment, in this time, in this uh, dimension of time and, and space, um, humanity and the material universe could become the Christ, like the final step of becoming Christ of the material universe. Um, so after that, we all are able to be Christ in our humanity here and now in the same way as Jesus and Mary did. Um, so what would it mean sense, to, to be Christ? What, if, you were to be, if one were to become Christ, what would that mean for the person? That means to be one with your true identity, with your true self, which is love. And because love is the fundamental of creation, when you become one with that, which is your source, you become one with everything, which is real. So Christ is love, and love is the fundamental and the essence of everything that exists. And um, Jesus Christ came to complete, to let's say, complete the process of becoming Christ, all of us. And in that sense, Jesus is love, as Mer Mother Mary is. And in that sense, he becomes one with the source of all creations in all dimensions, like you and me. Mm. Um, I have a friend who speaks of, he's an American, but he, he speaks of Krishna in much the way 
same way that you speak of Christ. Uh, when he was just um, 19 or 20 years old, this being descended from the clouds with a retinue of, of celestial beings. And he didn't know who it was at the time, but he had this exchange with him for half an hour. Uh, and it was visual, not just auditory, not just in his head. And ever since then, he's had this relationship. He discovered that this was Krishna. And he's had this close devotional relationship with God in that particular form. So um, obviously Krishna is a Hindu deity. And in, in the Hindu tradition, you know, they tend to honor all the saints and sages, and uh, including Christ and Buddha and, and anybody who seems to have achieved that status. And they, they kind of regard them all as representatives of God or as having achieved union or oneness with, you know, the ultimate reality, with our essential nature and so on. And they usually, unless, I mean, they might have their their chosen um, object of devotion, but they usually don't privilege one over the other. Uh, the, so uh, would you have that same orientation? Or what, how would you relate to somebody like Ramana Maharshi or Babaji or some, Ananda Moima or some of these great sages who seem to be one with God, devotees of God and so on? What would their relationship to Jesus be? Well, I think um, I always talk from I, my experience and from what I receive. And I think uh, we are talking about the same thing with those uh, traditions. Uh, and I agree with them. Uh, I think it's all about names and symbols. Um, so Jesus said to me once, um, I don't care whether you call me Jesus, you call me brother, you call me father, or you call me your friend, as long as you call me yours. So um, I think Jesus is the name of, um, it's a symbol for us, but we need symbols. Because uh, like you said in your conference, um, people, some people say that this doesn't exist and doesn't exist and that doesn't exist. But your experience is that they do exist in your experience. And that is true. So we need to see and um, understand and have symbols. So, uh, which in other words means to make God human. So the union of God and our humanity is what Jesus means for me. And of course, other traditions have the same experience and the same knowledge, but they use different uh, names. And I'm okay with that. I agree. I completely agree with those traditions. Yeah, well, that's a good answer. Um, and it's worth noting, we're emphasizing what you just said, which is that, you know, pure abstract divinity is abstract. And, you know, we as human beings, we need a focal point of attention. So traditionally, throughout so many different cultures, there have been ways in which people have made something somewhat concrete of universal, unmanifest divine intelligence so as to be able to f engage with it, it you know in a personal manner through using their their senses and their their heart and you know something we can actually focus on um and that has taken many forms but um what well, there's a line from the incredible string band whom you're probably too young to remember but it was light that is one though the lamps be many yeah, and that is absolutely true. So it's all about our humanity. Um, of course, God loves our humanity. The message here is to love our humanity and accept who we are within love, within God. So um, it is Sebastian? okay to... to your, your yeah. voice broke up a little bit there. So let's have you, re you said uh, just everything you just said since I spoke, say it again and we'll edit out the, uh, the breakup part. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Sure. 
what I said was that um, the key message here is to accept our humanity and to integrate it into love. So uh, God, of course, loves our humanity and it is okay to have our limited understanding as human beings um, and integrating that to the huge, you know, dimension of the uh, of what God is. So, um, going back to your conference, when you talk about the paradox, here we have a paradox, and that we can integrate and accept. We are everything, but at the same time, we are who we are. So, when I asked Jesus, one, what does it means to be Christ? He said to me, if Christ wouldn't, uh, the, doesn't exist, you wouldn't have an identity. So Christ is the identity of your being extended by God. So the you know, fullness of God becomes limited in your own identity. And you love to be in that way. The, the, sometimes the problem we have is we don't accept our, limited, our uh, uh, limits because we believe they are limits, but they are not. They are one expression of love. Our uniqueness is really, really holy. That's really interesting. Um, in your book, you say, now we, are, now we are the observer, the observed, and the relationship between them. We are the creator, the created, and the relationship between them. We are one and triune. And um, what that evoked in me was just the notion that, you know, if God is really omnipresent, then there is no place where God is not, and there is nothing which is not God. And um, although from our limited perspective, we it may appear that, you know, God is hidden or doesn't exist or is only here but not there but from but but what what is actually happening is that is god <laughs> having that limited perspective having chosen to squeeze the ocean into a drop as it were that's a very interesting and uh, thank you for putting this uh, um, in this way uh, if you read the um the first part of the book, when Jesus Christ uh, introduces the book, the first book of um, Choose Only Love, he says what you are saying now. He says, there is no place where I am not. And he gives like some kind of poem um, telling where he is to let us know that there is no place where love is not. And the interesting thing here is that um, the difficulty that we find most of the time about finding God is because we don't look for him inside our soul, inside our heart. So if we think about having someone hidden, we are going to look for him outside ourselves. But what happens if the person who you are looking for is inside you and you are looking for somewhere else? Um, so that, that's what was, Jesus said to me once. You don't find me because you don't look for within the only place where I am, which is you. Mm. Yeah, I like that point. Um, you could say that, I mean, where's the easiest place that you're going to find something that is omnipresent? Well, it would be right where you are. <laughs> so, I mean, you could right. look off on, on Alpha Centauri or something like that, but actually, you know, God is as much right here as there. So why not start with here? Um, and then maybe later on you'll find them in Alpha Centauri. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that's what the traditions always say, that God is most readily uh, and directly found within one's heart. 
at least initially. Right, and going beyond that, um, Jesus said to me, I gave you the eyes to look, which means for you that if you want to find me, look at your brothers and sisters. Understanding that God is everything uh, brings me to understand that um, Christ is in you and that's the place where I can find it. Um, so um, I believe it's very important to walk through the path of finding Christ in our brothers and sisters. Yeah, yeah. You know, one thing that always strikes me is, um, I mean, holiness or divinity or God or all that can be felt within, yes. Um, but it's also, in a sense, it can be seen in the world. Um, and as, as, as if God is hiding in plain sight. When you think what we're actually looking at, when we look at a, a butterfly or a grain of sand or a single amoeba under a microscope or anything that we look at, we're, we're looking at this marvel of, of creativity and um, intelligence on display. And it's, it's just there all around us in every particle of creation as far as we could imagine, you know, out through the universe. So it's, the, it's, it's like, you know, there's this ocean of, of God, ocean of intelligence, and we're, we're like fish swimming in it. And it's really quite obvious if we, if we think of it that way. Or if we, and it seems to me that would ripen or mature into a much more palpable perception uh, uh, over time. It won't just be sort of an intellectual thing where you imagine how amazing a cell is, but there would just be this constant appreciation of, of everything that you apprehend. Right. So I think that that brings me to the concept of contemplation. So um, observing from the eyes of love is for me contemplation. And when we look at everything through the contemplation, we can find and experience that wonders that you are talking about. Um, so we can be in an attitude of discovering every single minute of our life, the, the, the miracles of life, the mystery of life. And um, once you have that way of watching everything, observing everything from the contemplation standpoint, you really can experience um, the vastness of this intelligence. Yeah. Um, and I found myself saying, how could God create something like this? I mean, looking at the bird, or different way of expression, and you really start enjoying creation. Yeah, you do. I saw a cartoon the other day. It had a, a mother bird and a baby bird sitting on a wire, and the mother bird said to the baby bird, you are the universe thinking you're a bird. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, a few questions came in. Let me see if there's one here that's appropriate just now. All right, this one might be relevant at the moment. This is from Rose Gannon in Bluebell, Pennsylvania. Um, A Course of Love talks about the elevated self of form. How would you describe that in your experience? I think it's uh, what we talked before. The elevated form that is talking A Course of Love is about being Christ in our humanity. We are a new humanity, and I'm not talking as a master saying something that others don't know. I'm just talking about what Jesus said to me. We are now uh, living as a new humanity. Um, human is not the same 10,000 years ago and now. We have different human beings, even though we are all human beings. The new human being is the human God, the human Christ. So the elevated form is the integration of all of our humanity 
into Christ. So the question is, how am I going to express the Christ that I am? And the answer is? It goes to, to the free will. I mean, in your conference, you started, uh, you opened the conference saying, uh, giving the example of some people believe in that there's no free will. And uh, I, I was thinking about that. And what I understand is, the will, the, the free will, is just about expressing love or not. It's just about our relationship with love or not. How we respond to love. Um, so there is a relationship between the creator and the creation. So the question is not how much God loves me or whether God has a relationship with me or not. The question is, which kind of relationship I would have with him. And that's my uniqueness. The answer is my uniqueness. Everyone responds in a different way to the same question. So in other words, it's the responsibility is on us to form the kind of relationship that would really be meaningful. It's not just, we, we can't just sort of do whatever the heck we please and expect God to do it for us. Right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. So you linked the, the subject about free will and responsibility. You said, you get the example of God going to the jail because you, you did something wrong. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in other, was, in other words, I, I was it. saying a, a person might say, well, I have no free will and everything is, that I do is just automatic and it's the will of the divine. And therefore, if I rob this store, it's the divine robbing the store. And then I said, okay, well, then it's going to be the divine going to jail also. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that, that comparison. Um, so you related free will with responsibility. If we think about responsibility as the ability to respond instead of, you know, taking, being in charge of something, our ability to respond for me is the meaning of free will. So we all respond in one way or another. So um, as you said in the beginning, I come from a large family. I have 15 brothers and sisters, which is a lot, yeah. And I had the opportunity to see in the same family, same mother, same father, completely different way of responding to the same facts. So it's interesting to talk with my brothers and sisters because they see a different mother or a different father that I see. And I understood that our memory our mind and our heart make something with what we receive and we respond. Um, so the elevated form, um, as it said in, in, in the Cross of Love, for me is the Christ we are has to be expressed and the, the answer is how we will express it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we're we're talking about free will and and that one has a choice to, and in my experience and observation, um, you know, <clears throat> we have we don't have a complete free will to do anything. I can't play basketball like you know uh, LeBron James if I feel like it. Um, you know, so <laughs> there's a certain limitation that we have, uh, and we have we have a certain amount of wiggle room you know, that we can move in one direction or another. Um, and certain choices lead to greater freedom and other choices lead to greater bondage. Um, and you, it's like, you know, you want to go from Chicago to New York. Well, if you start heading west, you're going in the wrong direction. You're getting farther from New York. But if you start heading east, then you're getting closer to New York. So it's kind of a matter of choice which way you, you choose to go. <laughs> Yeah, um, but actually, there was a time in which um, I received a lot of information and I was confused. And I asked Jesus, how can we handle, you know, different beliefs, different ideas, different uh, theories, and which of them are true? Um, and he said, the way to 
avoid confusion is to bring all discernment into love. Because for him, everything is about love or a lack of love. So we, he says to me that we are absolutely free because we are free to choose only love or not every single minute, no matter whether we go to play soccer or uh, basketball or whatever. Um, we can do that with love or with no love. And those are the only options we have because free will is all about choosing love or not. Now, it seems that, um, you know, there have been sort of supermen of love, as it were, you know, people who have just such huge capacity for loving and huge hearts and, and others, you know, not so much, just um, very shrunken hearts. And you can't, can you, I don't know if a person could go from being, um, you know, little league level love to, you know, professional level love in just one shot. It would take some time for the heart to unfold and develop and soften and, and, and so on. It, would you agree with that? Or is it possible for a person who is, has been living a very dark, negative life to suddenly be, you know, blossomed fully in love? Yeah, I believe it is absolutely possible because love is truth. And um, being in love is living by the truth. And it's living by the truth of who you are right now. And when we are honest with ourselves and we are connected with what we are being right now, and we are being love because love is what we are. So uh, how can I live by the truth every single minute of my life? And Jesus said to me, accepting who you are here and now and expressing that. Every time that you express yourself as you are, you are expressing love. So uh, no matter whether you are in the, you know, in a dark stage of your life, or you believe you are in the darkness, um, if you connect with that darkness and you express that, you are living by the truth, so you are being loved. So love is not something that we do, it's, uh, it's just what we are. So it's all about identity, Rick, and what I'm trying to say. So every time that you are being who you are, you are being God. Yeah, and perhaps you can choose. I know there are examples of people who underwent rather sudden transformations. St. Francis was one. Um, Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, you know, on the road to Damascus, all of a sudden he, he got zapped and underwent this huge shift. Um, Valmiki, who wrote the Ramayana, was a highway robber, and um, he met some sages and who instantly sort of inspired him, and it, he, had, he sat and meditated for six or seven years, but then came out a, a saint. So people can undergo profound and radical transformations. Um, Usually, I think most people, it's, it's a little bit more slow and incremental and gradual as they kind of purify and in uh, their being, but it can happen quite suddenly. Yeah, um, that is also very interesting what you, what you say, because there are eagles and there are also fly lights. Um, and Jesus said to me, you are not called to be the sun shining, but the fly light. Fly light is like uh, a small light? Uh, yeah, like, like, like the small light, which are, you know, flying in the darkness. They are tiny, small. Oh, like, I think, I think you mean like the fireflies, the little bugs that fly yeah, around? Yeah, okay, gotcha. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That was because of my English. Yeah, you are right. Um, those creatures, those beings, have light, but they are small, beautiful, holy, and then there are big stars, and the same happened with birds. There are eagles, there are small birds, uh, there are, uh, and Jesus calls me as 
is honey bird. Uh -huh. So he doesn't want me to be an eagle. So there are people who have such a, such a great transformation and made very great things and they become celebrities in some way. But most of the time, we don't need that. We just need to be who we are, as simple as we are, and to love our tiny way of being, being like a drop within the ocean. Because Jesus said to me, even if you write a book that uh, it becomes, a, the, let's say, a bestseller, yeah? or one of the greatest books in this um, time, how much people you will contact compared to the whole universe? It's nothing. And he, he, said, and he said to me, even if you write a book that can go to every single person in this world, that means nothing compared to all the creatures, because everyone are my sons and daughters, including dogs, birds, the wind, and everything. So you are called to integrate everything into the totality. So um, I don't believe, um, let's say in a different way, when I understood that, when I received that revelation, I started to feel happy with not being such a wonderful person I have to, I, I'm, I'm supposed to be, or such a, you know, making such a big transformation. Um, Virgin Mary said once to me something that I would like to share uh, now, which is when you prepare the breakfast for your daughters, for because of love, you are being God. So uh, it's not about doing great things. It's about doing whatever you do with a lot of love. That's good. If we could use an analogy, if you think of God as sort of the electrical supply, the electrical field, then in your house, you might have a little night light, which gives you, which serves a very valuable purpose in the middle of the night when you have to get up to go to the bathroom or something. And then you might have a spotlight out in the yard that's really bright and it lights up the whole backyard and you have your TV and you have all these different things that are plugged into the electrical field and that express that electricity in different ways that are appropriate for given their particular function. And you wouldn't want the TV on in your bedroom all night or the, the spotlight is shining in, in your bedroom all night. You just want the, the nightlight and that it, it does its thing. So it's like each little, we could say each, each of us is, a, is, is like an appliance that's plugged into the field of God. And, as, and we each serve our own particular function. And it's just right for us. It's, it's not somebody else's function. It's our function. And, and that's the best way we can, we can serve God. Yeah, and the beauty is being who you are. So Jesus um, called me during this process of receiving and writing uh, a pencil in the hand of God. And um, that is the expression that I use a lot because I, uh, it reflects what I am. Uh, a pencil is nothing with the, with, without the hand. And it's completely meaningless if it, there is a, a, not a mind, you know, moving the, 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 the pencil to share something. Um, maybe there are some other people who are computers or uh, something much bigger than a pencil. Uh, but in my case, I'm a, a pencil. And I love to do that, and I, I uh, learn how to love my uniqueness. Nice. Now, I'm curious, and I bet you other people are curious. Many, many times so far in our conversation, you've said, well, Jesus told me this, and, and Jesus told me that. Um, what is the actual subjective experience you're having when you communicate with Jesus like that? And I presume it's a two-way conversation. You, you, you've also said, I, I asked him this question, and he answered that. So um, how can you describe in some detail 
what your inner experience is when you're having these communications? Yeah. Um, the relationship with Christ is a relationship. And um, we can grow um, with that relationship as we grow with any other relationship. So uh, once we go more and more united to Christ, we can listen to his voice more and more clearly. And at the end of the day, we can integrate that voice and that voice can absorb everything that we are. So we can listen to him 24 hours a day, every day, with no interruptions with your activities. So um, I would say just to use an example, that um, for me, listening to the voice of Christ is like a tape recorder, like you push some one button and then you listen, and if you don't want to listen, you just pause it, um, something like that. Yeah. So earlier in the in our conversation, you said it's like when Jesus spoke first spoke to you, it's like, you know, it was familiar because it was like a, a long term relationship. The way if your mother all of a sudden started speaking to you and you hadn't like if my mother died years ago, but if if all of a sudden she started speaking to me, I think, oh, yeah, that's my mother. Very familiar. I know who that is. And so is it like a voice in your head? that comes? Is there any visual component? Or is it just um, kind of a deeper, more intuitive feeling that you kind of translate into words in order to make it um, intelligible to others? All of them. All of them, okay. Um, so sometimes the communication comes into words uh, from mind to mind. So sometimes I have visions and I see Jesus um, with his body um, in his humanity and I can read perfectly well in my mind all the all his thoughts it's like he's thinking in my mind uh, so there is um, a clear communication from mind to mind and sometimes uh, it happens just from heart to heart and sometimes that happens without any physical vision. Like I, it's like talking with you, but if I close my eyes, I know you are there and you can talk to me um, and I, I, I listen to you. And sometimes it comes to my in, intuitive part of my soul and touch that and gives me more creativity. So um, something that I really would like to say here is that Jesus Christ loves us. And as much as we open our heart, as much as he gets into our life, and he will finally uh, talk to us in all the ways possible. Um, sometimes if you need to receive a letter saying something, you will receive that. And uh, that is very important to say here. Mm, there are many times in which he says to me clearly, I will talk to you through this person or through this other person. And he does. To let me know that Christ also talked to us through our friends, through our families, through our brothers and sisters, and also through different circumstances. Yeah. Well, we were talking about earlier about how everything is God and every little particle of creation is, is God. So it would seem to me that the whole creation is constantly talking to us, so to speak, um, you know, communicating. or uh, it's, <clears throat> it's pregnant with meaning and significance. It's not just dumb rocks and stuff. Right, so because uh, we have time, he says to me, um, you will know this or that. And I said, how I'm going to know that? And he just says, you will know that. 
and then you do. And you do, and, and you receive the answer um, in infinite ways. So uh, I think God can talk to us um, in every single way, using everything, even, even your illness. That's very important. Uh, you, you can find the voice of Christ with your suffering. Yeah. I say this really because I, I listen to some people saying that once you are connected to God, suffering is gone away or something like that. And illness sometimes is seen like a, a lack of spirituality or elevated form or something like that. Or you're and being I don't punished believe, or something like that. You're right. Yeah. And I don't believe that. Um, most of the time, Jesus talked to me in the most deepest and lovely way during my illness that I have a lot. Mm. Yeah. I mean, again, if the whole universe is God, if, if it's all the, that the divine in appearing to have taken form, then everything in the universe and everything that happens has some kind of evolutionary um, agenda, some evolutionary significance, if we can see it, or even if we can't yeah. see it. <laughs> yeah. I'm just asserting a thing that I often think, but just to put a cap on that point. Um, here's a question that came in from John in Texas, and um, Texas is famous for fundamentalist Christianity. Um, John's question is, one of the things that has stopped me from total acceptance of Jesus is the dogma, which over time has grown out of the book of Revelations. It's so beautiful and natural to accept Christ as the embodiment of the love of God and as source. It is not so easy to accept the idea of the unforgiving nature of Jesus presented in Revelations. It seems impossible to reconcile divine unconditional love and the threat of everlasting hellfire. What I would say is that um, we are talking about love and we are talking about relationship. So um, I watched many videos of your interviews, Rick, uh, and I love them. And I saw that sometimes you ask about who God is and those kind of questions. Um, and I think it's very important to move from our mind to our heart to have the experience of the relationship with Jesus Christ. So what I would say to John is to keep in your own relationship with him. It's a relationship of love. It's a relationship which is unique as any other relationship. So um, once you have the experience of love, you don't need others to tell you who that person is because you experience that. Yeah. So what would you say to these people that say, well, you know, you're going to burn in hell because you're gay or because you did this or because of that? And, you know, I mean, that doesn't that has turned people away in many cases from Jesus and from Christianity because they just don't like that dark and, and you know, scary perspective. They, 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 they can't conceive of God behaving or treating people that way. Yeah, um, actually, John used the right word, saying dogma. Yeah, yeah. Dogmatism, dogmatism separates. So, um, Beliefs can separate. That, that is why I always go back to our heart, to our feelings. Um, in my heart, I would never conceive even the idea of a divine love punishing anyone. That's something that I feel. And of course, some people say that uh, punishment can exist. And what I say to them is, well, that's their belief. I don't feel that. I feel love and I feel that I was created to be loved and everyone was created to be loved. And that's what we are going to do as much as we are united to Christ. 
I don't believe in punishment. I don't believe in anything uh, different than happiness within love. Yeah. You know, if a child, let's say, is, has dirt behind his ears and the mother scrubs it with a washcloth, the child might feel like, I hate this. She's punishing me. And he's, Stop doing that. You know, but the mother is, loves the child and is concerned for the child's welfare and so on. So, you know, in a theme that we have touched upon a number of times now, you know, I would say that everything that happened, that God, well, if we can personify God, God wants everyone to rise to the highest status of evolution possible. And that everything that happens is actually in the service of that, even though it may not seem like it. Absolutely. And I, um, again, thank you for pointing this, because there was once when Virgin Mary said to me, I, uh, you are my son, I'm your mother, and I have the right to be with my son. So um, when I asked her, what, how, should I live my life? She said, as a baby in the arms of a mother. And when you think that we are babies in the arms of God, uh, in the arms of our divine mother, that is very helpful to understand our relationship with God. And she explained me clearly well, that sometimes mother, um, goes with the baby to the doctor and gives some medicine that the baby doesn't like. However, it's the best for the baby. So he, she used the same example as you are using now. And I think that you are absolutely right. Sometimes the issue is our interpretation. We believe it's a punishment, but it's a, a, a grace actually for us. Yeah. And many people end up saying that, you know, they're, they're going through some terrible thing and they don't like it. And then later on, they think, you know, I wouldn't have chosen to do it any differently. For instance, I, I interviewed this guy named um, Damian um, Eccles, Damian Eccles, who was unjustly accused of murder and spent 18 years in prison, much of it in solitary confinement. And it was a really horrific experience in prison. But he managed to survive it by going deeply into a spiritual practice, which was meaningful to him. And now, I mean, now his eyes are ruined and his teeth are ruined and everything just because of the the, the darkness and the poor food and all that stuff. But he says, you know, if I had it to do all over again, I would, because I wouldn't have had the opportunity to go so deeply into that, into that spiritual practice if I had just been living an ordinary life. Yeah, I heard, I, I heard about him. Yeah. And that's a perfect example of what we are talking about. Um, so love will do anything to bring us into his heart and God knows us and he knows we can, he knows how powerful we are. Um, so one of the things that we do is we, um, we believe in us as, as powerless people, but we are not, we are not. So love can never bring you something that uh, will hurt you. That, 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 that brings me to the experience of trust. Trust and love for me are, you know, part of the same thing. It's part of the a unity. Yeah. So it's all about trust in love. Yeah. And, you know, you, you grow to trust your mother, even though you <laughs> sometimes it just doesn't seem like you, she's doing what you like, but over time you you gain a trust because you know where her heart is. You know how she feels about you. Yeah, and we need to trust. We really need to trust to be happy. So I would say if we trust love, we will never interpret anything from the point.
point of view of punishment or something like that. So going back to what Virgin Mary said once to me, she said, live your life as I did when I was in the earth, which is living with unlimited trust. And that's a wonderful way of, uh, of, you know, understanding our life. If we trust with unlimited trust, we will never think about punishment and hell or something like that. Yeah. Here's a question that came in from our friend Muffy Weaver in North San Juan, California. And um, I think we could relate this to what you were just saying about trust. Um, She said, she asks, how have you balanced being in the world with your spiritual life, such as with family, business, and things like that? I would thank for this question again, because we began this interview saying that um, the voice of Christ said to me when I was young um, that I had to be in the world without being of the world. Um, Which, as in case people don't know, that's a line from the Bible, also be in the world but not of it. Right. Um, and I would say that once we understand who we are and that we are love and love is Christ, everything in this experience is integrated into love. So um, family is a place where I can express love. Friendship is a place in which I can receive and give love. And this world is a perfect world in which I can give and receive love. Because what Virgin Mary said to me once was, you cannot love what you do not see if you don't love what you do see. Huh. So Say that again. You here, cannot love what you don't see if you don't love what you do see. That's the way you said right. that. That's interesting. Right. So um, how can I express myself if I'm love, loving you and being open to receive love from you? So I believe this world is a wonderful world that gives me an opportunity to receive and give love every single minute with my family, friends, and humanity. And love sometimes takes the way of forgiveness. So um, families sometimes gives you a great opportunity to forgive. And um, when you forgive others, you can forgive yourself. So they are a gift for me. Hmm. It's very interesting. I mean, there are people in this world who make a big fuss about how much they love God or they love Jesus and all, and yet they don't seem to love people (laughs) or they don't seem to behave in in loving ways uh, always. Some people, I'm not saying all people. Um, So I think that's a very poignant little, little phrase. You cannot love what you don't see if you don't love what you do see. Right, and going back to our conversation when we said that I need to see the Christ in you to find the Christ in me, Mm. I can start understanding that God is my family, my friends, my neighbors, the natures that I have, and even the society that I have. So uh, I can express compassion with others and with me as well as part of the of this world so um heaven begins here and now with our reality it's as simple as our reality uh cooking by love um talking by love doing this just for love and doing everything for love here and now and then we can keep going forever and ever. Because the, one of the question is, if we don't love here, why are we sure that we are going to love in the kingdom of love? Ah, yeah, good point. <laughs> um, here's a question that came in from Elliot Robertson. Not sure where Elliot is located, but it says, 
A course of love begins by saying, this course was written for the mind, but only to move the mind to appeal to the heart. Could you provide an example of how our minds can appeal to the heart? Well, I believe uh, an example is when we start experiencing that we, there is no discre discrepancy between our heart and our mind. And if there is a discrepancy, we follow our heart until the, that discrepancy disappears. So that's what I believe that um, expression is all about. Um, sometimes there are discrepancies we feel something that we want to do, but our mind says no. And we have to solve that discrepancy. And if there is no way to integrate that, we have to, we should follow our heart. And that's the meaning of bringing our mind into our heart for me. Good. Um. Here's a question on education from Catherine in San Jose, Costa Rica. For the most part, educational systems around the world develop rational faculties with a little bit of artistic and physical education, but they forget about the heart. How can the heart be educated? Or at least, how can we learn to open our hearts? This is something um, that we cannot learn like, um, teaching or something like going to school, I would say that the way of learning that is practicing it. Uh, because God is all about experience. And um, so we need to practice um, feeling, accepting our feelings and letting our feelings to conduct our decisions. So that's what I would say, just practicing it. Yeah, it, cult it gets cultured more and more over time. And also you talked about trust earlier. It seems to me we can not only trust God, but trust our own heart to be a, a useful or a, a reliable guide in life. <laughs> yeah, which, which also needs to be practiced. Yeah. I yeah. mean, we, we know how to trust when we practice trust. And same happened with love. That's why the Choose Only Love book uh, that was recently published um, talks about healing the memory. Practicing brings us to our own experience here and now with our humanity. And that has the power of bringing us the, what we forgot. So uh, we all know what love is but we forget uh, about that. And we, we actually forgot. So it's all about remembering and practice allows us to remember and remember so that becomes a habit. Mm, good. And so what would be a good way of practicing? What are some examples? For instance, people practice meditation or they practice yoga or they, they do different, they, they go to church or they pray or they do different things. Mm -hmm. what, are, what would be a recommended practice here? Loving. Practice love. Love everything. Love everything that arises in you. Everything. Everything that arises, so, yeah. Right. Everything that arises. Um, that's the... Um, there is a, a chapter in Choose Only Love that talks about that practice that says this is not about practicing uh, some particular way of praying or meditations or reading or that kind of uh, practicing, um, which is related to education because education is all about practicing and repeating different acts to, be, to become habits. Um, what we are talking about here is practicing unconditional love. Trusting everyone, even if there is no reason to trust, just trust them. Well, since, since she asked about education, I mean, here's a good example, which is that, um, you know, kids in school can be very mean to each other. There's a whole problem with bullying. Uh, and sometimes kids actually commit suicide because they've been bullied so much. Um, 
And um, <laughs> I, I remember when I was a kid in grammar school, I would sometimes befriend the nerdy kids. Maybe I was one myself. But if, if somebody was being picked on, and, and I'll, I would actually make that person my friend and hang around with them because I felt sorry for them or something. And, you know, I, and I was kind of a nerdy kid too, so maybe it was birds of a feather. Um, but if, you know, if, if kids were to hear this, they would think, yeah, you know, I mean, what, not only what does it do to this, this person in school who I pick on uh, because he looks different or ha has his wear, hair a certain way or whatever, um, or whatever, but what does it do to me? You know, because I think if we uh, tr mistreat somebody, we may hurt them, but it's like a it's like a knife that doesn't have a handle and it's sharp on both ends. It's all knife. You know, we might stab somebody, but at the same time, we cut our hand. So we we get injured as much uh, or even more than the person that that we're hurting. Right, and if we understand that we are here to grow in our knowledge of love, in our knowledge of who we are, uh, which in other words means our knowledge of God, that experience of bullying or whatever the experience we have, which can hurt me or others, um, has to be integrated into love. Uh, maybe that shows me how you know, how cruel I am with others. And that gives me an opportunity not to be selfish and arrogant. And for other person, that situation can give the opportunity to grow in forgiveness. So, um, and you gave a great example about schools, uh, which is something we can see all over the world uh, having, you know, violence and that kind of uh, situation. And I believe that it's because there is no love. Um, we need to move our education system into love as everything, including the business world and any other human aspect. Um, schools don't teach you love um, because they don't bring you to the practice of love most of the time. Um, and we are facing the effect of that. If we have a, an education system in which we only give information, but we don't allow people to find wisdom, uh, people get um, you know, tired and alienated and uh, suffering. Yeah. There was a story on the news about a month ago where some kid who had been bullied and picked on um, brought a, a shotgun into school and he went into the, I guess, into the, into the bathroom, into the men's room. And maybe he was only going to shoot himself, but who knows what he was going to do. But anyway, this coach um, encountered him and rather than be violent in some way, he just took him in his arms and hugged him and he kept hugging him. And then some other teacher came and took the gun away and he just kept hugging the guy even after the gun was taken away and just telling him how much he loved him and how much, you know, how much, how special he was and all that stuff. And he, this guy was praised on the news for, for that particular reaction, but you know, it could have been a very different outcome, but he somehow turned it around with love. Absolutely. I think you gave a great example. Uh, that boy needs the experience of love. So what is happening in that case is, and in any other case of violence, is that there is a lack of love somewhere. And um, we can heal that, uh, showing our love to them. So I hope love will become to be the most powerful weapon we use for the future. Yeah. When I think of love, I think of, um, you could think of a scale uh, or a spectrum of um, refining and softening the heart or, or, or coarsening the heart, making it cruder and grosser and harder. And you, you can kind of move in either direction on that spectrum and according to what you do. I mean, there are certain things which if we do or say, 
it's only it's going to make our heart harder. In fact, in in the Bible, it often says, "Well, you know, the Pharaoh was going to let the the the, the, the Israelites go, but he hardened his heart, and then he changed. You know, and he wouldn't let them go. So that, there's that expression of hardening the heart before doing something mean. And I think doing mean things actually does harden the heart, whereas doing something compassionate or loving softens the heart. So it's like a we were saying earlier about whether you could go from being extremely hard-hearted to a saint overnight, eh, maybe not so common, but you can at least move in that direction by doing and behaving in a way that, that cultures the heart or refines it. Right. Um, what brings to me now with your reflection is um, that there was a, very important knowledge and understanding in my spiritual path uh, that changed everything in my life, um, which was to understand that I was created to be loved. I was not even be created to love because love extends by itself when it comes to me. So, we have been created to receive love. And if we receive that, then love extends by itself. So the experience of receiving true love, pure love, transforms your life into love. So it's all about receiving love. So that boy that you gave as an example, as, as well as many other people in, in violence uh, situations um, are asking for love, for having the, the experience of love. So um, we, we need to have that experience and go back to that. And I think that violence goes up and up um, as a shout of Cry requesting for love. love. Yeah, yeah. Right. I'll give another nice example. That I, December has been a month in which I haven't been preparing for interviews because I've been airing ones that were already recorded. So I've got a chance to watch some things and read some things that I ordinarily wouldn't have. And I just watched a series called um, College Behind Bars, which was about these um, prisoners in New York State who um, were offered a college education by Bard College while still in prison. And... Um, the, and the, the teachers were very respectful and loving, and it was remarkable how good these guys and women uh, were as students. They were, uh, many of the teachers were saying they were better than their regular students back in, at the college. And they ended up at one point having a debate with the Harvard debating team, and they beat them. They won the debate. So, and here's, here's people who grew up in ghettos and very unfortunate circumstances and broken families and all this stuff who just totally blossomed when given an enriching opportunity like that. I'm very familiar, Rick, with what you say, because one of the activities that I do is to go uh, to conduct a prisoner's group every Wednesday and Saturday. Um, and I go to the largest prison uh, here in Buenos Aires, um, and I share a course of love and uh, whatever we do in our uh, foundation. And... Um, I have the same experience that you mentioned before. Um, they, uh, they are really happy to receive love. That, that's all we need, uh, just love. So, um, and love is something that is beyond words. Um, they say to me many times that they feel love because of my presence, even more than because of what I say or not, because they said, you take a long trip to come here, you are never absent, you have a commitment with us. So we feel that we are important to us, to you, and we need to feel that. Uh, so it's all about love. I, 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 I absolutely believe on that. We can heal everything with love. And it's worth mentioning that these students who took the college courses, they have a, a 4% recidivism rate, meaning going back to prison after getting released, compared to about a 50% rate 
in the general prison population. So it makes a huge difference. So when you consider how much is spent on keeping people in prison, and the United States has the highest per capita of imprisonment of any country in the world, um, you know, if that money were spent to actually do something that enriches the people, um, then we could <laughs> kind of have a lot fewer prisons and, and prisoners. Um, and I, it's, I don't think this is a tangential point because it, it's, a, it's a concrete demonstration of love to do something that helps a person rather than merely punishing them. Right, definitely. So how to integrate them into society, how to make people feel useful and needed and how make others to feel how important they are and how beautiful they are. Uh, so we need to go back to our original stage of, you know, innocence and holiness and show others uh, that part of the side. That's what, for me, is the meaning of the Christ in you, is all which is holy in you. Yeah. Um, a question came in from Glenn Hoverman from Nevada City, California. He asks, um, please explain how your book, Choose Only Love, was received by you. And before you answer that, um, I wanted to ask, in many chapters in the book are subtitled, A Message from the Voice of Christ Through a Choir of Angels in the Presence of Archangel Raphael and Archangel Gabriel. We haven't talked about that yet. So we've been talking about communicating with Jesus, but there's something, it seems like most of the passages in your book were received from the voice of Christ, but through a choir of angels and in the presence of the archangels Raphael and Gabriel. So, please explain right. that. Right. Um, when I started receiving Two Only Love, the first experience that I have was that um, I received a presence uh, suddenly, and that presence, full of love, introduced himself as the medicine of God. And he said to me, I'm the medicine of God and came here to ask you to pray what I'm going to tell you to pray for nine days. And I did it uh, without asking anything. And um, after that, uh, I started receiving um, the day after I finished the nine days of praying, I started receiving the experience of a core of angels coming to me uh, with uncountable amounts of angels singing and bringing beauty and bringing with them the voice of Christ. And um, then comes to me images and music that is transformed into symbols by Archangel Raphael. Archangel Raphael was the manifestation that was introduced himself as the medicine of God. So uh, Two Only Love came to me in that way. So uh, it always comes the Court of Angels and uh, shows me uh, magnificence and beauty of creation. And after that, the voice of Christ start um, talking in my soul in a language which is not words, it's music, uh, but my mind understands the meaning. And then I translate all of that into words uh, and uh, Archangel Raphael is with me, dictating me what is has to be translated and how. So that, that's the way it comes to me. I'd like to make a point. If, if some people are experiencing a bit of incredulity about, you know, archangels and angels and, and all of this, um, one way of understanding this is just that, <clears throat> you know, you could think of creation as being like an ocean where you have the surface level of the waves which is obvious but then there are deeper levels of the ocean which are not obvious so there are subtler 
realms of creation, which are just as real as the concrete realms that we experience in daily life. Um, but ordinarily, we don't experience them because we have either lost or not gained the capacity for that refined perception. But in the course of spiritual evolution, sometimes or perhaps always eventually, that capacity is regained or is aw aw awakened, and a person may begin to experience these things. In fact, you know, I, I know people who experience them, well, you're, you're one apparently, <laughs> but others who experience them just as routinely as, you know, walking through the mall or, uh, you know, walking down the street. It's, it's like, it's, it's as if you, you kind of become a, to use the ocean analogy again, you become like a scuba diver who is comfortable with exploring every level of the ocean. And, um, you know, you become, it becomes a direct experience for you rather than merely a concept. So anyway, hopefully that puts it more in context. I think it does. I think the analogy with the ocean is perfect because once we go um, deeper and deeper you know, uh, in the ocean, everything is different because we have different lights and different beings um, and we see more, more and more. So I agree with, with what you said, Rick. Yeah. <clears throat> When I'm doing these interviews, I often sort of think of who might be listening and I often get feedback later sometimes from people who are listening. And so I try to think of, OK, what point can we make here that would, you know, connect with this or that yeah. person? Yeah, I know. And what I would like to say here is the experience itself is not um, essential, although it is important because it gives us the opportunity to understand what is essential here is love so the love that is put into those words and to bring you to have your own experience of the divine love okay good um you mentioned this earlier and i want to come back to a point where you say the main message of this work is that the time for a new humanity has arrived humanity is ready to manifest the living christ in each of us we are each of us Christ. Um, well, for, first comment on that, and then I'll ask you a question. Go ahead. Go you mean, uh, yeah, you mean make, my, my comment? Yeah, say something about that, and then I'll have, yeah. I have a question for you. Yeah, uh, as I said before, we are in, in the stage of a new humanity. Uh, so the new is already here, and that's why we are facing a lot of transformation. Everything is being transformed because of the new... Uh, consciousness, this new humanity, and this humanity is um, humanity united to Christ. So we are all called to express the Christ who we are, and that's the meaning of the Second Advent, based on what you Somri Lab wants to say. Okay. Well, you remember earlier, John from Texas referred to Revelations. <laughs> And Revelations is very symbolic and cryptic and hard to understand, but there are parts in it which sound like things are going to get pretty wild around here. <laughs> um, and then, you know, there are people, you know, Extinction Rebellion is a movement that feels like <clears throat> human extinction is a, a real possibility. And there are various environmentalists who say, I mean, there's one guy, for instance, I listened to recently who said that even if all people were to disappear from the earth tomorrow, were the, the sea levels are still going to rise 20 or 40 feet over you know the, ne the the remainder of this century which would you know since the people aren't going to disappear would result in huge upheavals of of society and of economies and and all this stuff so um does the birth thing of a new humanity involve <clears throat> a period of great chaos and disruption and you know are we sort of entering into that now? And um, you know, what in your communications with Christ, what what kind of message has come through about that? Thank you for pointing this out because um, there are a lot of messages that I receive saying something quite different than what is listened. Uh, now about the chaos or, or, or that. Um, Jesus said very clearly to me, 
that the earth and the world will not be destroyed because whatever becomes one with God can never be destroyed because it's eternal. And once he become human as Christ and human, the whole material universe became holy because of what he is. So uh, transformation is the right word here. And um, integration into love is what is happening. So um, Christ is coming in, in, in this time, and this is a, a new consciousness. Um, and that was we are experiencing. And because this transformation is universal and it's too big and too new, we don't understand and we are afraid. And that's why we have a lot of projection of fear. Um, but based on what I received, uh, I received the opposite of anything related to destruction or uh, this, uh, chaos or something like that. Um, Virgin Mary said to me very clearly, these are the time of my victory. She, she didn't say my victory will be in the future or something like that. We are now in the time of the victory of love. Um, so we will see um, the heaven in the earth. I believe that too. But even now, destruction is taking place. Look at the Amazon rainforest not too far from you. And, you know, Bolsonaro's opinion, uh, attitude toward it. Um, look what's happening in Australia with these fires. I'm, I'm in communication with friends who have been on Batgap who are, had, had to evacuate their, their, their home. Um, so on a local level, there's definitely destruction and it's quite ap apocalyptic in some cases. Um, the question, I guess, is how widespread will it become? If, if there's a huge increase in sea level, for, uh, for instance, that could be really uh, disruptive. If we go up two or three or four degrees Celsius in global temperatures, that will be extremely disruptive and you know, major cities will have to be evacuated. So, I mean... You know, there's the ideal which we'd like to arrive at of uh, heaven on earth, but then there's the, you know, the rearrangement of things that might have to take place before we arrive there. Yeah, um, but it's all about relationship at the end of the day, from my point of view. So uh, what is happening, based on what I received, is that um, it, it shows that we need to change our relationship with, uh, with the earth and with uh, environment. And that's what we are doing, because uh, what you said is true, but also it's true that humanity never before experienced and manifest such love to the earth. This manifestation of love as well. So we are facing both. Um, there are more people expressing their love to the earth every single day, more than ever before in humanity. We see the move, the movement of um, Greta Thunberg or people Good. like that. Greta Thunberg, young, yes. Yeah, yeah, young people, uh, even here in Buenos Aires, uh, very aware of uh, loving the earth because they are the new beings, the new humanity. So uh, it is true there is a transformation, but on the other side, we never saw people loving the earth as much as we are facing today. That's a really good point, and, and it warms my heart to hear you say that. And it's you know it's the kind of the hope that I live with, and um, you know, and I'll just rephrase it slightly, which is that you know yes. Um, things seem to be on one level getting worse and worse and worse. And there's so many examples that we can cite. But on the other hand, there never before has been that we know of a, um, a mass awakening in, in, in collective consciousness as is, Absolutely. as is now taking place. And um, you don't really hear too much discussion of that when you hear people uh, elaborating on the problems because they don't really know that it's happening. But 
um, some of us know that it's happening. <laughs> and this whole show that I do is based upon the fact that it's happening. Um, and so in some way, which I don't completely understand the mechanics of, um, I think that this awakening that's taking place is nature's or God's antidote to the dire situation that we've gotten ourselves into. Yeah, and everything comes to us to uh, grow in terms of knowledge and expression of love. So uh, we, of course, ha are accustomed to focus on the darkness, to heal the darkness. Uh, but there is another way, which is healing by walking through the light. So focusing as well in the in, in the light, uh, I see a lot of light in that area. Uh, I see people um, helping dogs in the in the streets. Um, new regulations, countries changing their laws into uh, you know uh, like in Buenos Aires, for instance, they now they eliminated all all zoos. So um, animals can, oh, yeah, okay. As, you know, um, so animals can never be in jail uh, anymore uh, by law, uh, which is a which is a big change to see the government, uh, uh, you know, dictating a law which protects the right of animals. Yeah, that's great. So uh, now in this country, as, uh, as it happens in a lot of countries, you cannot hurt uh, uh, an animal with no punishment. And that's a big change. And I see a lot of light. Yeah. On that. Well, you know, when you look at the nature of the problem, and specifically global warming, and you look at what has, how it has been going with the, you know, fossil fuel companies, you see that the whole thing has been motivated by, uh, to a great degree, by greed and short-sightedness. And, um, you know, profit, profit you know, short-term profit, this quarterly, you know, your quarterly bottom line, as opposed to what the world might, condition it might be in 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, as if living as if there were no tomorrow. For instance, you know, Fossil fuel companies sit on five times the amount of carbon that we can afford to burn if we want to keep the global temperature under two degrees Celsius, and they fully intend to extract and burn it, which really can't happen. I mean, if it does happen, we're, we're cooked. So, you know, the antidote ultimately is the opposite of greed and short-sightedness, which is love. <laughs> right, right. So I, I think the key message here is that the Earth and... Humanity is saying, shouting that we all need to go back to love uh, to survive. It's, it's just a, a matter of survival. And people know how to survive. And we will understand that the best way to survive is to love each other. Yes. And not only to survive, but to thrive. Right. Right. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Yeah. Well, that might be a good place to wrap it up. That's a kind of a positive note. Um, is there anything that we haven't discussed that you would like to discuss? Pretty much. No, covered I it? think that, yeah. Uh, I mean, love is so huge, so we can talk forever and ever uh, <laughs> if we want. And I really enjoyed this interview. And I really would like to say thank you, Rick, for what you do. Uh, I really love. Uh, Buddha at the gas pump. Um, and I would like just to make one comment about that. And during the manifestations, Jesus said to me that there would be uh, expressions that will allow to show the different ways of expressing the same love. And I strongly believe you are doing that. And I really want to thank you for what you do, because love includes diversity. So we all talk about the same love in different ways. Um, so I, I really thank you for that. Well, thank you. And that's definitely my feeling of the, the diversity point you made that it's, um, well, you know, they say div diversity or div variety is the spice of life, right? And um, the more um, nourishing an environment is, the more diverse it is. 
like if you go to the Amazon rainforest to refer to that again, it's a nourishing environment for life. So there's a huge diversity of plant and animal life, which you wouldn't find in the Sahara Desert. Um, so I just kind of feel like in the garden of God, so to speak, um, diversity is a natural expression. And, um, you know, and having everything just be the same one thing and, and nothing else is contrary to the way God rolls. I agree completely with you. So thank you for expressing that. It's very needed and very uh, appreciated. Thank you. So um, I'll show the cover of your book here, uh, Choose Only Love, which, and I'll have a link to it on your page on batgap.com. And it's the first of like five books or something, isn't it? Seven books. Seven books. Yeah. And you'll, you're just continuing to receive these and you'll keep putting them in book form and making them available. Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, now I'm receiving um, another book, uh, which is going to be called um, "From the Heart of Mary," and I know that uh, I'm going to receive a second book after that, which is going to be called "From the Heart of Jesus," and both are going to be a unity. Great. Um, and are they in Spanish as well as English? I imagine they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Yes. Good. All right. Well, thank you. And do you do anything in person with people or, you know, do you have Skype conversations? Do you teach retreats or anything yeah. like that or mainly just books? <laughs> uh, um, I do everything that the spirit wants me to do. So um, I do Skype with people. Uh, I'm open to uh, for retreats. Actually, the place we are, where we are now in the island, as I talked in, in the beginning with you, is uh, is conceived as a retreat center. Oh, nice. So I receive people. I talk to everyone who wants to talk with me uh, through Skype, Zoom, personally. I go everywhere that needs me. I, I'm very open to that. Great. So people so, could probably through your website, it shows how to get in touch with you and people can do that Absolutely. if they want to. And it'll probably Absolutely. have a thing about your events if there are any events scheduled. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thanks, Sebastian. I've really enjoyed getting to meet you. I hope to meet you in person someday. Thank you very much. And thank you for making me feel so comfortable. Oh, well, vi vice versa. I feel comfortable too. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Rick. Love you too. Um, Thank you. And just to close, um, thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Um, we will be now resuming our regular weekly session of recorded interviews. And so there'll be another one next week. Um, and go to the upcoming interviews page on batgap.com if you'd like to see the schedule. And you can even sign up for a little thing to ha have it put into your calendar to give you a notification when the, when the interview is taking place. Okay, thanks for listening and watching. See you next week. Thanks again, Sebastian. Love to you. Thank you.